this talk um, has a lot of uh, things which you, I think would be interesting to students. Uh, most of you will probably be seeing whatever is seen over here for the first time because there not has been many, I don't remember any cosmology talks in the recent uh, time and also nothing which uh, is, uh, does anything about is the effect or, you know, uh, secondary CMB and isotropies and stuff like that. So this will all be new. Um, now, <clears throat> this is something that uh, I got very interested uh, uh, in the last two years. And um, interestingly, this was the last chapter of my thesis, PhD thesis, which was 20 years back. So 20 years back, uh, I wrote uh, something from my last chapter, which was about these radio galaxies and CMB distortions. Uh, it was never published. And uh, nothing much has happened in the 20 years from when it was written to this, except one very important thing that happened was there was a, a detection. So I will come uh, slowly to uh, this important thing that happened, which sort of rekindled my uh, thing. And uh, so I'm going to talk about this. This is basically based on two papers. One uh, just published, one it's not submitted, I didn't submit it. It should have been submitted. <laughs> anyway, but um, so the thing that you see over here are radio galaxies, picture of radio galaxies. So it's radio observations, okay? I will come to this in, in a slightly more detail. And over here is a picture of a galaxy and the same, the radio jets, which is perpendicular to the, you know, the disk of the galaxy. This is the mainly are elliptical galaxies. Now, no, it's no, not there. To, but there, I think, is listening from here. No, is it? No, I don't listen from that. Go to the settings. This is I Go to the settings and change this to like I want to join the mic to stop. So, uh, going to settings, everything is very complicated. No, no. It's fine. I should do it. Exactly. Where is it? No, but okay. If this happens second, then you're going to recalibrate this whole thing. No, but this is the speaker as well. Yeah. Okay. So let me start by uh, introducing uh, something called secondary CMB anisotropies. So, yeah. So there are a lot of things which is not working properly. So this is a slide from 14 years back. As you can see, this is an NSF colloquium TIFR 28th, November, 2007. Okay. So that's almost 14 years back. And this was the last slide of my talk. So my talk at uh, that time was about doing cosmology at, with galaxy clusters and mainly with uh, looking at counting galaxy clusters and how they basically help us in looking at dark energy and stuff like that. But at the end of it, I basically ended the talk saying that, but this is not uh, uh, the end, more is there to come and showed a picture, Okay, this picture. Well, let me try to explain what this is. So I hope all of you know what your the cosmic microwave background and must have heard about the uh, CMB anisotropies and I've seen the power spectrum figure where you see this wiggles, okay, this, this plot. So you have what is known as CL, that is the power at different L values versus L, L is a multiple, which is almost inverse of the um, angular scale. So larger multiple means smaller differences during two directions. And you have this plot over here, this figure over here is black, which is the primary CMB anisotropy. So everything that has been done, all the great results of CMB, which sort of established CMB and cosmologies at precision science came from this plot. And you basically establish the standard model of cosmology by fitting cosmological model of minimum six parameters or extended parameters to this plot. Okay. This 
happens from photons that are coming to us from the last scattering surface. Okay. However, what can happen is what can happen is that those photons can have additional distortions on the way to us between the last scattering surface and us. So these photons did not have any more distortion. So this photon, whatever anisotropy happened at the last scattering surface, that is the possibility of that. But in between the last scattering surface and us, there can be additional sources of anisotropies. And these is really a zoo. And these are known as the secondary CFD anisotropies. And over here, I have plotted different ideas of secondary CMB anisotropies that people have proposed. Some of them have been observed. Some of them have not been observed yet. It is more difficult to do this. Two reasons. First of all, if you leave out this green one, you can see mainly the anisotropies have strengths which are much smaller than the primary CMB anisotropies. So it's more difficult to observe it. Number two, these are at smaller angular scales. We need very high resolutions. So although, for example, this thing needs resolution of degrees or few arc minutes over here, you have to go arc minute, then you have to go smaller than arc minute, and so it becomes more and more difficult. So strength and the resolution, that makes this thing more difficult to observe. On the other hand, you should realize that this has information only from the last scattering surface, and this has information from everything that happened to the universe from redshift of a thousand plus. Okay. So this tells a lot about the how the universe evolved, what happened, the energetic seven. Okay. And you can see I'm basically not going into the details. The most important one, which people have observed and observed quite a great deal, is what goes by the thermal is the effect for clusters. So this dash dash blue dash line here. And people have done cosmology with it, and this cosmology is quite precise with this. Okay. And then there are other things which have been proposed. Okay. Some of them I have done. Uh, some of this, uh, uh, there are some very exuberant planes over here, for example, proto galaxies, but look, these are at very, very small angular scale. So I'm not sure whether even in the next 50, 60 years you'll be able to do that. What is that? For example, that it seems too high. Yeah. So this is, is not this is probably not correct. This is the first secondary isotopy that most people discussed, and it's model. And this is the one that uh, sort of we are doing right now. We are doing it. Yeah. But yeah, there are certain interesting things that can happen over here. Okay. So this is what it is. This is sort of the history of the universe. I don't want to go into this figure. This you know stock figure. You have the universe starts over here. This is where you're observing. You know, there's a last scattering surface somewhere over here, and then the dark universe. So if the private isotropies come from the last scattering surface. So it sort of has information of things happened over here, and the secondary isotropies come over here from this. So everything that you see over here, this can scatter photons, and it will give rise to secondary isotropes. Now, if you look at the CMB sky, so if you look at the CMB sky, this is so this is a simulation, but this is a sort of but a good simulation of the CMB sky. This is how a primary CMB anisotropy will look like unfiltered. So there are big patches. Okay. These patches are large in size. So the biggest ones are degree size, maybe a smaller degree. But then when you start filtering them, when you start looking at this patch and trying to be having a resolution in angular size, which is smaller, so you know it better, and also try to have your uh, uh, the strength uh, to go down to lower strength. Then if you filter by a four arc minute beam, you don't see much difference. You filter by a two arc minute beam, you suddenly see there are some smaller anisotropies that you can see over here. Can you see? These are not there, you couldn't see it over here. And then when you go to 10 arc second filtering, you see lots of sources are popped up. Okay. What is the actual, actual signal? What is the actual activation of the signal? Over here, you cannot go much lower than this. This is from an in-body simulation. So uh, it will also depend on whether there's enough signal for each of these. It's not only a spatial thing, but also how much amplitude. Okay. But the whole point is that there was this featureless kind of stuff in the primary anisotropies, and then you have all these features coming out. These are the secondary anisotropies. Okay. Now, 
if you look at this, then you can sort of look at the goals for the next generation of CMD or the current generation of CMD are basically threefold. One is to do more primary acidosis and try to look for primordial B modes. I'm not going to talk about this, you know this. Then there is trying to search for early universe spectral distortions, which is what uh, Rishi is an expert on. And then the third goal is the secondary CMD and acidosis. Now, these are the three major goals of CMB studies or CMB telescopes that's been working now and planned for the future. Okay. As you can see, one of the interesting things about secondary CMB and acetophys is that a lot of things can be done for the ground. So most of the planned telescopes, which are, which are funded, has already been built or being built, not like which is on the proposal, are actually ground-based. And so they will be doing a lot of the secondary CMB science. So that's a really, really rich area to look into in the next 10, 15 years. Okay. Now, this is a very mock uh, thing. So it's not very difficult to get out uh, the secondary anisotropies from uh, the main sky map, okay? So this was an old simulation that I did many years back. So over here you have, this is a map of the CMB, okay? It has both primary CMB as well as secondary CMB. And it's done for these three uh, frequencies. These are the frequencies that uh, one of the CMB telescope, uh, which is more called ACT because it has been upgraded, is to work on, okay. And this is the map. Now, what you can see is that some of the secondary CMBs have the unique spectral features. So what will happen is that although the feature of the primary CMB remains the temperature delta T, does, does not depend on the frequency, the delta T for the secondaries will depend on the frequency. And so what you can do very simply without doing any, anything fancy, what you can do is that you can basically subtract maps, look at the sky at two different frequencies and carefully choose a frequency in which there are no secondaries, subtract it and then scale whatever you think is a primary back to that frequency. And suddenly what you see is that from this map, which had both the primary and the secondaries, you have a map where there is some noise and you are suddenly getting all these structures. Okay, very simple, no fancy thing, just subtraction of maps. Okay. And in fact, if you try to basically look at, this is also in temperatures. And then if you want to detect the sources, you can do that. And you see there are many, 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 many sources. These were the sources that was there. Already. All of them, of course, in reality will not be a, a source that you can detect. Some of them will be larger, bigger, you will detect it, some of them will be very lighter, but these are all sources. So very simple subtraction of maps can give it. Of course, things are much more complicated. This is very simple. Over here, what we have basically said something that there are no foregrounds. Okay, there was just primary and the secondary. Okay. If there are foregrounds, then the simple thing will not work because there will be more noise and stuff. Okay. Now, let me connect one more thing before I go into this. So you know, people talk about these large scale structures and there is gas in these halos, which are these galaxies and cluster of galaxies. And people show simulations like this. And most of the time, so people who have heard CMB talks, secondary CMB talk before, they'll talk about clusters of galaxies, which has this hot gas. These are where this, you know, this kind of uh, things meet, the nodes, and these are the big, large dark matter masses over there, the cluster of galaxies. But you also see there are these smaller sizes, which are smaller size halos, not 10 to 14 solar mass halos. These are halos, which will basically house other structures, which are actually then second in line for this secondary acid. And these are all the things that people have been talking about. People have already looked at the secondary acid from here. So one of the things that can be in this kind of object, so let's say this is a big galaxy, an elliptical galaxy of 10 to the 13 solar mass, is that in one of these objects, there may be a radio galaxy. So here is a picture of two pictures of radio galaxies that I showed before. So let me try to explain what you see over here. So this is a radio galaxy. So this is observation in radio. So this is basically this, region that you read is an observation that you get in radio. Okay. 
matrices. Okay. This is mainly synchrotron radiation. Okay. The main galaxy is over here. And at the center of the main galaxy, there's probably a black hole. And from this black hole, what is happening is that there's an accretion disk out of the black hole. And perpendicular to the accretion disk, there's two jets, which is going out. So you can almost see one of the jets in this size, another jet in that size. These jets move out, and then at some region far away from the center, and this can be quite large, so hundreds of kiloparsecs, maybe even a thousand kiloparsecs, a gigaparsec size, this giant radio galaxy. There is this really, really hot spot. These are called the hot spots. Okay, this is where sort of the jet goes and hits uh, the ambient medium. Okay, the jets are, of course, over the time of the radio galaxy are propagated from here to here to here. So this thing was closer at early time to the larger. And then there is this region over here, this diffuse region over here, where the material that has gone over here has sort of overflowed. These are known as the lobes of the radio galaxy. The whole thing is sort of the cocoon of the radio galaxy. So this region, or this region, or in general, the whole region over here is a region which has basically a lot of energetic materials. These energetic materials, in principle, can distort the CMB. Just like the gas in a cluster of galaxies, hot gas can distort the CMB. Galaxies of the other hundred kiloparsecs. Yeah. This jet is about these are few hundred, few hundred kiloparsecs. This is few hundred, three, four hundred kiloparsecs. Yeah. But I mean, there are gigaparsecs. So it's just... One problem of getting these very large uh, size cocoons in radio, which doesn't happen in CMB actually, is that as it becomes larger and larger, it becomes fainter. And it becomes fainter, you cannot detect it. So there may be these large cocoons there. But just cannot detect in your radio. So, what is this ambient medium? So, is the artist kind of galaxy in big clusters of galaxies? It can be in big. So, in big. So, this is not in a big cluster of galaxies. In a big cluster of galaxies, this will not go this big because it has to flow through a denser environment. So, a few hundred kpc, maybe 100 kiloparsec is what the maximum. But these are basically field galaxies. So, these are basically IGM in which it is. Now, if you have to work with these radio galaxies, you have to know the, understand the physics. The physics is not simple, it's quite complicated, but I'm going to try to go very quickly through it. I'm sorry, because I'm going to put in many, many ingredients. Sorry, so, what's the oh, these are optical observations, and so these are some X rays, photons, I don't know. This is the galaxy. These are your smaller clumps. So, the central part is observed using also radio or something else? No, this is optical and radio. Oh, so the blue is optical. Yeah. Okay. So let me make a schematic of this radio galaxy, the physics of this radio galaxy. And this is something that. So this is a schematic of this radio galaxy. This looks very much like a radio galaxy. Think of it like this. Here is the center. This is the central engine that pumps the material. Then there is a collimated jet. Okay. It has an opening angle. I'm going to do it very simply. It can be made very complicated. There's an opening angle. Then it goes, and there is this hot spot, this hot spots over here. And then you see there is this entire region, which is this entire region, which is called the cocoon. And each part can we can call the lobe. So lobe and cocoon are sort of interchangeable. Term. And what is happening? So you can think of this radio galaxy like this. So try to think of this. Think of it. I have a water cannon and I am basically putting this water cannon and let the water go jet spray and go against this wall. Now think of the wall being on wheels. Because of this momentum being transferred, the wall will move, right? There is material which is being accumulated already behind the wall and that's also being accumulated. So because the wall will move, so this is the wall in some sense. Because of the momentum, this hot spot will start moving like this. There is material behind it. The material become thicker and thicker. There's going to be a shock over here, which will be a bow shock. Also, what happens when you put a water cannon? The water goes and flows like this, right? So what is happening? It is filling this region with this water that's getting basically rebounding from the wall. So what is happening? Material over here is basically filling this space, okay? And at some point of time, this space is getting filled. So 
not only this will be expanding this way, there will be an expansion in this way also. Okay. So it turns out this is a self similar expansion. You can solve the equations. And this is how the radio galaxy will propagate. It will depend, of course, on how strong the central engine is. So the central engine must have some luminosity, how strong the central engine is. It will depend on all the physics that goes over here that will tell you how quickly it uses all its energy. It will depend on the material that is all around. So how dense the material is, okay? And it will depend on basically I'll, I'll tell the processes. So all these things that will come into it and we have to solve this equation. Now, what I'm looking at is the material that is over here. So you can see it's a huge amount of material over a large region. The only difference and which makes this difficult and why this has not been done before is that this material over here is not thermal plasma. What has happened is that over here, there has been shock acceleration. And so the material that is being pushed in over here is a non-thermal plasma. So this is basically non-thermal electrons that is filling this. Around, just a quick yeah. question. So in the simplest case, in uniform density of mm -hmm. the medium and so on, one would expect that initially the jet would slow down and then it would go at some terminal velocity because once, yeah. right? So yeah. that's the simplest yeah. case. Yeah. So generally this will, so jet will not slow down. Initially it will be very fast. But then it will start expanding like this. Okay. And at some point of time, it will become self-similar expansion. And then the velocity of, you know, rate, you know, the long velocity will yeah. be constant. More or less constant. And it will depend on whether this is pumping or not. At some point of time, this radio galaxy will switch off. So, so in the sense that I'm taking a water analogy yeah. a bit seriously. So what I would expect that once the water velocity is the same as the wall velocity, you know, then after that, no further. The wall velocity is due to the water velocity. Correct. But once they match, then the wall is no longer pushed by the water, not accelerated by it. Yeah, so there's what will happen is that the pressure difference between these two is going to keep on. So the pressure over here is going to become smaller and smaller. Once this becomes equal to the ambient pressure, then, then it stops. And this why this is why this can go up to gigapascal size because in the IGN, the ambient pressure is very low. Okay. What determines the uh, open angle? Hmm? This opening angle? Magnetic fields, probably. That's columnist the whole thing. There are actually much more complex. There are shocks over here. You know, there is two shocks over here, actually. So, I mean, you can do this in as much detail as you want or slightly more tractable that I've done now. Okay. Now, as I said, I first looked at this when I was doing my PhD. Just one more comment. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I think and, uh, is it the inverse of the Lorentz boost factor related to the Lorentz boost factor? Or is there something that I just missed? Uh, one over gamma is theta. No? In general, one over gamma is theta, but over here, I'm not sure it's, it's a much more complicated. It depends on the shock structure. Yeah. Anyway, so this is what I had done when I was doing a PhD. Over here, as, as I said, just to show, I said there are these two. This is one length scale along the jet, and this perpendicular two length scale, and these two have two different equations. You have to solve it. And then the energy inside also you need to constantly solve for it. And you solve these three equations simultaneously and you find out how the jet evolves. Okay. And, um, but now what people have realized is that, as I said, the jet becomes self-similar. So if you live for some amount of time, then the actual ratio of these jets more or less is two, roughly. And they've looked at this observation. They looked at many, 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 many observations and they find that the actual ratio is two. In fact, now, when I went back and did this, if you leave it for enough time, the actual ratio becomes two. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. So with that simplicity, I'm going to work it out. So I'm going to go through this very quickly, but I hope I have written down the physics as uh, to assume that the radio galaxy has a central luminosity QJ at the center. This is the luminosity which is pumped. So we don't know what it is. We have to put some numbers to it. We can get some estimates. Okay. And remember that it injects these particles over the lifetime of the radio galaxy, which is some lifetime TJ, which is, you know, um, a million, many million, because the radio galaxy has to be so big. So that gives you some idea of how big lifetime can be. It has to be 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight years. Okay, 100 million years at least, because otherwise it can become so big. Okay. Now, the low of course expands in a surrounding gas. So to do you correctly, 
you have to know what is the density of the surrounding gas. So that roughly is for IGM, that is sort of the density, in terms of magnitude of density. In a cluster, it will be larger density, and it will also have a density profile. I'm just giving the hmm? density 20 grams per cc. Ah, sorry. There is no grams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no grams over here. Okay. The yeah. The then there's this non-thermal electron distribution. So it has some power law. Okay. It has some gamma factor over here. Now the evolution of this radio galaxy, this thing will sort of evolve as long as the central engine is giving away energy. Okay. And very simply, you can see what is happening over here is some work is being done and some adiabatic losses are happening. So you take the PV, you take the DDT of PV. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So that tells you how the central engine and the work done. So this work done over here, by the way, has some very interesting uh, physics. So I'm not going to go over here. People talk about how the central black hole heats up the surrounding medium. And one of the dominant theories is that it is basically because work done by these bubbles and that will heat up the surrounding medium. And a lot of it can be generated. So what is the actual ratio? I missed that definition. So the actual ratio is from the center to the so L by R. Oh, so think of it as a, don't think of it as a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cylinder. So think of a cylinder R and this is an L. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, you can look at the energy, the magnetic and the particle energy density in the lobe. So this is, don't look at the notice, it's very not very complicated. Think of the pressure and energy. So if you have uh, gamma, okay, then there is an equation between pressure and energy. So basically your energy is P by gamma minus one. That's it. Okay. And now you sort of realize that the, the two energies, the magnetic energy and the particle energy, this has to be distributed with some fraction r. Okay. Okay. So this is basically forget about this part. This is basically r. So what is happening is that r by r plus one is one, and r times each other. So that, that's just the distribution. So if we know what is the pressure, I know what is the energy in magnetic field, and know what is the energy in your uh, uh, particle, and this fraction, there is a very simple arguments which tells you at the minimum level, this fraction is basically goes like, this is the R, this fraction goes like this quantity where this alpha P is the power spectrum. This is the power of the, uh, uh, of the, you know, the particle energy. Okay. So now you have this. So now you can calculate the radio flux as a function of the size. So your response. Yeah, yeah. So for if the partition, let's say, alpha would have to be one. You know, alpha. Alpha. Yeah. Right? So I think then it would be right? yeah. no, it would have to be one. So alpha would have to be three for every one. Alpha P is three. So typical something like this. Yeah. Like some number like so is alpha around yes. Exactly. So, yeah. That's that's actually that's that's the theoretical reason for putting alpha equal to three. Observationally, people would prefer alpha to be around two point something. Alpha over the power alpha? Yeah. Spectrum gamma to the power yeah. minus. Yeah. So the larger alpha means it is a steeper spectrum. Yeah. And if okay. the spectrum is steeper, alpha is large, then A is large. Then you have more energy in magnetic fields. Less energy in particles. Because it's steeper, so less energy in the particles. Less number of high energetic particles. Right. Now, the thing why is that? Why the steeper, why the more magnetic, stronger magnetic field is in the steeper spectrum? Is this because the particles do the energy more quickly? So the spectrum becomes this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can also show you that. Anyway, so this size and the Q are connected. This is the bottom line. Okay. Now we can also calculate the number of electrons which will emit at a particular frequency. I'm going to go a little faster. Okay. The frequency at which the electrons were injected and the frequency that you're observing will be different because the electrons have lost energy and it's going to lose energy due to expansion and because it's cooling. Okay, so you can basically find out how the electrons, given an initial spectrum, what is the net spectrum at a later time? Okay, 
And then you basically calculate what is the energy in the electrons and you normalize the electron number density and the electron number density goes like this. Okay. Finally, there's one more complicated equation over here, which tells us that since the cocoon is sort of expanding, if I look at a small region of the cocoon, a small subvolume of the cocoon, the pressure in that small subvolume of the cocoon and this, this the central engine pumping it and how the, uh, this, um, this actual ratios are changing, these are all connected. So not because the cocoon does not have one equivalent, one simple structure, it has some structure inside. So within the structure, you can calculate this. This is a slightly complicated calculation. I don't want to go into this, but you can actually calculate how the small volume expansion is connected to the pressure. So anyway, we know what is the densities of these electrons, what are the energies of the electrons. So at the end of it, we can calculate what is the total synchrotron flux of the okay. This is what people observe. Okay. This is basically thinking there's a synchrotron, it observes a gamma squared, the Larmor frequency. Okay. And this is a, a rubik lightman formula. So we observe this. Some of these things can be observed, some of the things can be modeled. And now we can go at it. So look at a few things over here. So first of all, okay, let us look at this size. So these are the central energy of the engines, okay? As the size of the uh, cocoon increases, the radio power sort of decreases a bit slowly because it becomes more diffuse. But then when the engine in real life cuts off, the radio power drops. So you okay. data this is calculation. Yeah. Data you cannot see. You can see only one snapshot. Yeah. Radio power drops. So if you have if your engine did not cut off, then this would have gone like this, which is like this. It would have gone continuously like this. But it drops. The other thing you want to see is that over here, again, this radio power size. If I have a larger central cube, it will have a larger radio power, larger size emission. But you see, there is something where you can see there's a break over here. Can you see there's a going into the break? And these are happening, see that z equal to two, there is a break which is over here, z equal to 0.5, there's a break over here, z equal to 0.2. These are the observed where you're looking at the uh, radio galaxy. This break is because at larger uh, redshifts, your Compton cooling is very, very efficient. So when your Compton cooling is efficient, so suddenly you are losing the larger energy electrons. So that actually becomes very clear over here. So if you look at really the energetic electrons, CMP. CMP. Yeah. Yeah. So you look at this larger energetic electrons, this is a higher redshift to go, and then suddenly because this drops out completely. Whereas smaller energy electrons keep on. Okay. And these are very important because this is a unique thing that can, we can prove through CMB observations. For X-ray observations, radio observations, it was very hard to prove the lower energies and higher redshifts. Over here, the effect of the higher redshifts because of this cooling and the fact that these electrons will dominate, you can go to very, very low electrons, energies. Okay. So this is something that people have been trying to do for a long time. What is the lowest energy of this power law distribution? Does it really go to zero? Does it? There have been no clue. And this is linked to all sorts of radio physics problems, linked to how much energy, black hole physics, everything, but there is no clue. So people don't know what is. We have been actually first trying to do this and we have some results on this. Okay. Now it will depend on your power spectrum, on the power law, it will depend on the density of the outside medium. So forget about this is standard. Once I know how the pressure inside this cocoon is changing, I know what is the size of the cocoon. The CV distortion is very simple. This is a line of sight integral of the pressure. Okay. And I can calculate this, as you can see, once the jet stops, you have a fall in the CV distortion. And this is again for different, you know, outside densities, because outside density will basically 
make your proton pressure change separately, the lower density will go faster. Okay, now also it runs with this. <clears throat> so what we have been able to do till now is that we have been able to look at a model of the radio galaxy and calculate what would be the same with distortion from these radio galaxies. Okay. But that's not all. Now let us look at the frequency dependent part. So, okay. So let me see. Um, let me keep this. So this is for thermal synapse elevation effect. I don't have time to actually explain this. Let me talk about over here. So first we calculated what is the amount of amplitude of this, uh, of this distortion. But this distortion will also have a frequency dependence. And actually this unique frequency dependence of all these synapse, so-called synapse elevative effect makes it possible to extract it out, which is what I showed in the beginning. Because the thermal as effect for the cluster had a different frequency dependence, I can subtract it out. Okay. It's same over here, except that over here, the frequency dependence is much more complicated or calculating it is much more complicated than the thermal case. Thermal case, it was easier enough. Okay. So for the scattering of the neutral seek electrons with Royal factor gamma, an electron of energy, uh, uh, not electron, photon, sorry, a photon of energy epsilon gets boosted by gamma squared epsilon. So that's the boost that we have. So generally for thermal things, the amount of energy that is imparted is not that much, but over here, a lot of energy, so it will give a very large boost, okay. So over here, the spectral distortion obviously will be the function of the energy distribution of the electrons because this gamma is coming. So depending on how your energy distribution electron is, your spectral distortion will change. Okay. So for SZ effect, for example, thermal SZ effect, the spectral distortion is unique. Okay. Of course, if you want to do relativistic correction and stuff, that's different. You know the temperature, you know the spectral distortion. Over here, it will depend on what is your power or distribution of the electrons. Right. So you have your CMB spectrum. This is the initial CMB spectrum. It is written in terms of the scaled, uh, uh, variables, okay. And what you want to calculate is the spectral distortion. So you have a final CMB spectrum minus the initial CMB spectrum and multiplied by tau, which is the optical depth. And typically this can be written in terms of an amplitude, which you already calculated and the frequency dependent part. Okay. This Y was the amplitude that you already calculated, the Y in T. Okay. So we know this Y. Now we want to know this, what is the frequency dependent part. Okay. Now, till now, every, there have not been much about radio galaxies and non-thermal distortion, but whoever has done it, although they have been talking about non-thermal distortions, they would go and do it like this. They will either not do this correctly or not do this correctly. And sometimes not do either of them correctly, but still they will talk about non-thermal distortions, okay. Actually over here, remember this has to be a non-thermal. So you have to do it correctly like the way I've done it. And this also will be a separate spectral distortion, not the one that you have seen before. Okay. So now you have the pressure of this radiation. This is a standard pressure formula for radiation electrons. Okay. So if this gamma, I'm starting a new variable called p, which is square root of gamma squared minus one. So if I can constrain this p, I know what is the gamma. So minimum value of p will give me the minimum value of gamma over here. Okay. So I can write down the pressure of the radiation electrons. And again, there's a lot of calculation over here. What is important is that you take your initial number of CMB photons in unit frequency bin, and there is a scattering kernel that scatters those initial number of photons to a final number of photons in different frequency bin. But remember, the photons are neither created nor destroyed. The total photon is conserved. So the scattering kernel has to have a normalized to one. And what we get is that if we do the scattering kernel, then the integral over that gives you your final frequency distribution. Okay. Over here, I've skipped a lot of steps. So, but just very quickly, what does this scattering kernel depend on? What are the processes? Uh, it's just uh, oh, okay. compound scattering, yeah. But uh, with a, yeah. <clears throat> so I have some uh, photons. CMB photons, mm. and I inject a relativistic uh, distribution of electrons with some spectrum with yeah. the gamma factor. Mm -hmm. As a result, CMB gets distorted to J of X, 
Yeah. And then I know how to configure it because yes. I, yeah. I have to average over all the angles. So. In fact, this was first uh, part of this was this scattering kernel first written not for relativistic but uh, for the is Chandrasekhar's uh, then yeah. okay. So this is what thermal frequency spectrum looks like. So the difference, so delta minus initial minus. So as you can see, there is a dip. There is so photons from this region have been upscattered to this region, and that's why there is one region where there is no change. So if I have a single observation at this frequency, at that frequency there is no AZ effect. Okay, this is why I could separate out in this first picture that it had these two maps of the CMB sky. I could separate out, and that would mean whatever was left in that region was just primary CMB. For the non-thermal, this is the spectrum. So two things to notice. First, it is milder. Okay, for non-thermal, its proportion is milder. Number two, it doesn't stop. It's sort of because the larger energy has, there's always a large energy tail for, because there's a power law. There's always some very high energy electrons that gives enough energy to boost it to much higher frequencies over here. Okay. It drops at high energy. Huh? I mean, this at some point will drop when there can when the, there is a cutoff in the. No, no, why does it drop from high to Which one? This one. Uh, after the tail. This is the thermal. This one, this black line is the thermal AC, the standard AC, which is from thermal electron distribution. So it's just uh, there is some thing over here just going over here. It just conserve the number of photons in here. Over here, the amount of energy is given. There will be photons which will be really, really distorted. Uh, over here, I don't think the total energy is given as soon. It's slightly different. The Y is slightly different. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> not, not very different. And is each electron scattering the CMB photon only once or many times? Once, once. Only once. 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 Okay. Yeah, small very little, small. small. Yeah. So that will become more common. Over here, by the way, this is very good because these cocoons are very diffuse. So density is never very high. But the other important thing over here is look at this. So first look at, uh, forget about this pink curve, just look at the other. Ones. This is where the equipation was there. So your alpha was three, okay. The spectrum of power of the power thing is alpha is three. And as you can see, your GX, so this is the modulus. So there is what I've done is I've taken it the positive side, just the modulus of that. As you can see, that depends on what is your P minimum. So how low you can go in energy, that changes not only the shape, it changes the null point and it changes the shape, changes the amplitude. Okay. So your GX, the frequency dependent part is actually a probe of your lower energy tail of your, of your uh, numbers as a function of your energy. Okay. And then of course you can do it with alpha 2.3 and do the same thing again. So alpha 2.3, as you can see, has a smaller uh, amplitude of it. Okay. So depending on what you take, it will have a slightly bigger amplitude. This is more favored from observations. Three is more favored from just plain proportion. So this is important because if we can actually get this, then we are actually getting P. So we can tell you whether the energy distribution of the, of the number density of, of these electrons, how low it goes in energy. Does it really go up to P equal to one or is cut off at some higher level? So seriously, then if I go and measure the spectrum of CMB photons in, you know, in some region where I have expected this yeah. number of this effect, uh, if I measure this GX as a function of frequency, I can discover the value of, let's say, the spectral index of the injected electrolytic electrons huh? and the cutoff points exactly. of those yes. electrons to what low energy is exactly. do I have. Yes. Okay. And, and that, these things are not known yet. This is not known yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now what has happened? All these things were fine. Three years back, there was the first. So for many, many years, people have been trying to 
get, observe non-thermal is, although they are not doing it correctly, but at least they're looking at radio galaxy cocoons, radio galaxy lobes, and they were always getting upper limits. They would never. It started from 1970s, Birkinshaw and others. They kept on doing it, they were always upper limits. Theory, like my PhD work, or there was one or two simple theories, not much. 2017, these people, Malu et al. So Malu is uh, Malu, the Dravi Subramaniam. DNA actually is also involved as one of the authors. All these people had the first detection of non-thermal SZ from radio galaxy lobes. So this is the observation. So let me try to do it. This is the, is the bullet cluster. Okay. It's very close to the bullet cluster. It's just a coincidence, I think. There's nothing here. And the non-thermal SZ was observed over here. Okay. So as you can see, this is the region. So exactly the same size. It's not scale. And this, this is the part. And this is the two green. This is where the non-thermal SZ. And you sort of, you know, look at it and zoom it up. These are the two lobes of the um, of, of the radio galaxy. So this is a radio galaxy. And from the two lobes, they have observed non thermal Okay, This is an observation. So radio, then, galaxy, hmm? radio galaxy probably is at the center over here. It's not seen over here. See, in this picture, you cannot see it. Oh, this is uh, yeah, something else. Uh, some thing of the beam, I forget. Yeah. So there's two beams. It's done with ATCA measurements at 18 gigahertz and 5.5 gigahertz. But the interesting thing is that they have these two lobes. And if you look at the optical picture, they will have some thing at the center. Okay, so there is a radio galaxy box. So they have got one thing. And they have measured two things. They have measured whatever they think is their Y distortion, observed Y distortion. Actually, the, it's awful. It's got to be very careful. This is where they actually make a mistake. They do not measure the delta T. What they measure is the delta nu, the intensity of non thermal as delta nu. Okay, delta nu was remember was delta t times some g factor. Okay, measure delta nu, delta i, delta i, I, delta I. I'm, I'm saying delta nu, i nu, yeah, delta i, and they measure what is the radio galaxy flux over there. Okay. These two things that they measure, okay. and this is this they reported in Nature. Now, the question is, if we know, can we first of all come anywhere near to their measurements? There are certain uncertainties in these measurements. For example, we don't really know the distance to this galaxy. That was the biggest uncertainty in our model. So the galaxy could be at the same redshift as the bullet cluster, maybe in the front, maybe at the back. We don't know. Exactly. Uh, this is 18 and so it's all the decrement part. They measure it over here. 5.5. Uh, 5. So this is 10. So over here, 5 and 15. Is two digits. Yeah, so 5.5 gigahertz and 18 gigahertz. There, if you look at the lab plot, the signal is very small. Yeah, very small. So there, that's what is ATCA. They're doing it. You typically want it at least two sides. Two, two frequency. 5.5. 5.5. years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, 5.5. Okay, so now question is, we know what is the uh, radio galaxy flux, okay? Radio power that they estimate. We have some idea of what is their delta I nu. We can, from there, if I know what is the frequency dependence, I can know what is exactly the delta T, okay? So Y and T, okay? They don't measure Y and T, they, what they measure is again, I'm saying, they measure I, delta Y. So this is the flux radio power that they estimate. Okay. Okay. And we can have models over here, radio galaxy models. That should go over here. Okay. If I take the value of the source at whatever redshift is most probable, which is very near the uh, bullet cluster, then you get it over here. If the source is slightly nearer, so people have to work, then you get over here. So they don't see the exact same optical? No. You don't know that. No, they don't know. Actually, it's not written in the paper. We try to look for it very well. 
The wrong resource again, or that thing? Or they don't it? know uh, the exact redshift, so it's not written in the paper. So it's not identified with any known galaxy. Maybe I don't know. I'm saying it's not there. I ask people, they don't. Know. Oh, so what they okay? So what they have seen is just some two radio pole spots, and they interpret that there is some galaxy here. Yeah. This is some jet. That is some jet because these are two lobes. Okay, yeah. But it is not really being identified yeah. in galaxy. Yeah. I think it will be identified a galaxy if one does and does it. I, mean, I don't know why people are not following it up. Then we would know what is the redshift of this galaxy. But if the galaxy is slightly lower in redshift, then our model sort of actually matches with what the radio power and the Y non thermal should be over there. Our model doesn't have any error. Right? <laughs> this is just a. Is the error of the model? Is it, is it, most of the things are so okay. This is a difficult question. To so QJ is something you keep the number by hand. So you basically try to get from this thing and then try to see what is the error of these parameters. So there is no error in that sense of the model, other than alpha p. You take some alpha p. So you take alpha p either from radio observation saying the alpha p is minus two point three, or you take some alpha p from in the future, you would be able to actually. Yeah, so this is why there is degeneracy. This is That's why they will have degeneracy. You can see, you can have three my, different. My yeah. yeah. That's the degeneracy between your QJ and the jet lifetime. And that's the imagination of two. So no, there cannot be very much degeneracy because. Your radio galaxy lifetimes will be spanned by this. Okay. So it's not that a radio galaxy will have a lifetime of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 10. Lifetimes, there are ways of considering lifetimes from how your synchrotron spectrum is falling. Okay. This is of this order, lifetime. Okay. So it's not that completely. But within this, I can always tweak my QG a little bit and have my lifetime a little bit change. So there's QG and lifetime are completely degenerate, you know. And that. that in fact, over here, as you can see, all these lifetimes will match this thing. Okay. But if I know, if I correctly know what is the Y and T, then you are fixing your radio galaxy model. So your radio galaxy model completely becomes fixed if I know this correctly. Okay. That, of course, we cannot get exactly from their paper because, as I said, they have not done a Y and T. They have not done, they're not. Done a G spectral index, which is the non thermal index. They actually used the G thermal frequency dependence to get it. So there will be a small scaling over here. Okay. But all these models, given this is well measured, so this is the, this is the error bar, by the way. Thickness is the error bar of the measurement. Okay. This is why you can your delta I values at two frequencies and get some aspects of my yeah. number. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's what is done. That's why you got these two numbers. Okay, from that, you are from that, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so do you explain the line process? So, what is the fundamental difference of what you are calling different models? TJ, QJ. These are parameters. These are parameters. Mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Is, is the mechanism completely established beyond doubt? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, radio galaxy model can, you can make it as complicated as you want. This is the same. Yeah. Okay. But I think of models, different models, mechanism. But you know, I, I'll tell you, even, even if you have the more complicated models, Okay, I, I cannot be 100% sure, but these are the things that will matter the most. So your more complicated models will have, uh, so for example, I'll give a simple example. I have taken a gamma of four third, uh, yeah, four by three, relativity. Okay. Gamma is basically depending on the magnetic field, the uh, uh, relativistic and thermal. There's a little bit of thermal population. So an equal gamma may be a little different. Okay. so. Your, Better model will actually, instead of taking one gamma, you will have slightly different gamma. Instead of taking a, uh, uh, I, I could go back to the first thing. Instead of taking, you know, the way I have taken this two actual ratios to be constant, I can change the actual ratios a little bit. Those things will not going to change these numbers highly. What's going to change these numbers is the actual answer. To how much energy output the black hole makes, over which we have no clue. But now we can actually, if I, if I know this, I have measured this. So this is well known from some someone does. I have actually got the TJ. 
as soon as I get the TJ from the size of the of this thing, I know what is the QJ. So I actually are measuring what is the black hole energy input, which is something that people put by hand. We are going to measure it. So this is a large implications for radio galaxy agent feedback. Okay. The size <clears throat> These are mainly IGM, so ambient okay. densities are not that. You can do it in the uh, in the um, within the cluster of galaxies. In the cluster of galaxies, is very interesting. The cluster of galaxies, the radio galaxies, do not become very large, hundred kpc. But because the pressure is high, because so cannot compare, it's close to cluster pressure. So what is happening is that there is a component in the Y which has a non-thermal spectrum, but an amplitude. When you are looking at the total intensity and assuming it to be completely due to the cluster thermal gas, you are basically making a mistake over there. So the cosmology that is coming from over there is getting a bias because if there are radio galaxies in the clusters, you have to subtract that out. Okay. This is from one of the newest observatories called the Simons Observatory. It has different uh, frequency bands. These are the frequency bands which it observes. Okay. And as you can see, what you can, what you want to get is this green line. Okay. Question is having these frequency bands, can we get the green line? Given that there are thermal SG fluctuations from clusters, which is which is a noise for us. Okay. Then there are you know new distortions, the relativistic SG, there is you know movement of galaxies, all, all so think of these as well, whatever is adding, I mean there can be more noises. Given these frequency bands, can we get it? Okay. So we have actually done that, and uh, I don't have time to show that. Answer is yes. We can actually uh, detect this again to So there are nine frequency bands or something? Yeah. Three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, nine. And so one would think that something of the order of five to seven different physical components can be separated if you have nine different frequency bands. That's the rough idea. Oh, oh. You have more than you need more frequency, more frequency bands, obviously. And actually, future surveys have more frequency bands. The CMB S4, which is going to happen, that has 11 frequency bands. Okay. So if, just to again have some general knowledge, what, how many different such physical mechanisms create secondary? Like the important ones, you say, is it like five or is it 20? You are talking about absolutely different ones, or for example, this wide distortion can be wide distortion from clusters, wide distortion from galaxies. Are you going to take them as separate? Give me an answer that <laughs> you okay. think is useful. I would say over here, if I can, that will be very model dependent. Okay, so this wide distortion, uh, but the frequency dependence will be the same whether it's clusters or galaxies. I don't care about the amplitude. So I'll divide it one. So this, and then I'll, I'll you'll see that in a moment. There are what are the other foregrounds? So typically of that of 10, yeah. So what we can do, since we can detect them actually over here, they're shown, I mean, I've not seen the answer, they've shown. What the first thing you can do is that we can actually tell these observers which sources to look at. That's what you did. It's a gold mine of sources. I mean, you basically go and look at them. You are going to nail down a lot of uh, your physics that about black hole halo connection, the energetics, and things like that. And this is done for the Simon's array. And what happened? This is done for the Simon's array. And as you can see, look at, for some of the sources, look at the significance which, which you detect. So it's boost. So this is done with the, what is the noise of the Simon's array, sensitivity of the Simon's array. Okay. Okay, and these are remember. This is after taking into account all those components that you are saying. Yeah, yeah, taking all those components. So doing the. So this is the uh, flux of the non-thermal SC yeah. component, and how will you? They are non-zero at so many C. Yes. Yeah, because it's. Uh, expected or bigger? No, no, this is expected. This is this is. I, I tell yeah. them. I'm telling them to do this. This is signal just to signal to noise. Signal to light, light, light. This is a prediction. There's no component separation. 
no. This is flux created by the telescope. No, this is not just a flux created by the telescope. There is minimum component separation of the I mean, but not all the photons. Okay. For these targeted observations, remember, for non target observations, it will be no, very good. Why? So, when you do component separation, you combine information from all frequencies. But the, the noise, but the, but the noise at each frequency is different. Yeah, but why will there be different sigma at different frequencies? Because the noise uh, at this frequency. No, there was some blood. Yeah. So, you combine data from different frequencies, right? This, this is not after component. This is just this is a signal to signal. This is signal to Yeah. yeah. So, but certain sources, for example, this the one which has 9010, 9, you can have very high significance on both frequency and then you can do something. And then you can do something. Yeah. I think for most of the sources, you can. Which Simon said it. Simon. Yeah. So, this is now. And hopefully, they will do something else. Okay. So, one of the things that we did over here, by the way, over here, the fact that we can. From this and this, if I can scale whatever y they have done and then rescale it with proper g and get a y over here, put one line and then put a qj, is that I actually go and for the first time get what is the lowest the p minimum, p minimum the energy spectrum. And it goes actually to one to two. So it really goes all the way down. Lot of this. So this is coming from the data. This is from the model. So you take their data. Yeah. Then you scale it, data. scale it, and yeah. And then, so the model themselves couldn't do p minimum. They basically said they cannot be done because they didn't have a model. But you can do it. You can get a p minimum. Now one of the thing is that um, uh, so I completely lost what I was trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you get p minimum uh, and. Uh, that connects to a lot of things. So, okay. so that's the first thing one can do. Targeted observations. What's the next thing one can do? So how? how? Uh, that's the thing. The distance is not known very well. So two distances give you two distances. So for this future observation model, the one I have. Uh, this one? This shows the oh, these are distances unknown. See? Yeah, what? These are these are these are radio galaxies observed radio galaxies or okay. people observed it. Because these are big radio sources. Okay, okay. So you pick up what you think are good prospective radio sources and you do it. Yeah, yeah this is the one that I have given. This is the one that I have taken. Point three. So one thing is uh, basically so the way they have said is very close to the bullet cluster. You <laughs> Take something. It's a very arbitrary thing. So over here, for example, this um, one, this is point three. This is closer. It should probably not be associated with the bullet cluster. Because the cluster but it's, be like it's, it's outside the bullet cluster, but uh, it's not a very good place to look for. But this is still the first one. Okay. Okay. So now let us go very quickly. I'm, I'm running out of time. I've already done all the time. This is, I'll show you results quickly. This is one target of radio galaxies, but there are radio galaxies which are all over. There are millions and millions of radio galaxies. All of these have cocoons, and all of them are distorting the same. Okay. So then you should be getting a fluctuation in the CMB cosmic microwave background due to this population of radio galaxies. Okay. And that will give us, again, a very important uh, control on radio galaxy physics and cosmology because this distribution of radio galaxies depends on your cosmology. Okay, so for the first years, I'm not going to go through this at all. But what I'm going to go quickly is over here. How do I calculate the fluctuation? So again, there are complications. First of all, what you associate is that you associate each radio galaxy with a halo of certain mass. The right way of doing this is what is known as halo occupation distribution. It's something complicated, but people can do that. There is a formalism to do it. Or you can do something in between, which agrees with halo occupation distribution, which is easier. So you associate, you know, the radio galaxies you do not find in halos which are less than 10 to 12 solar masses because you at least in the big elliptical galaxy. And you do not get these radio galaxies 
in clusters. I mean, in the center of the cluster, there is a galaxy that may have a radio galaxy. So the mass range is 10 to 12, 10 to 14, typically is a mass range. Okay. Now, from simulations, we know how the masses are distributed as a function of mass and volume. Okay, so this is what is known as mass function. What you have to do is that you have to associate your radio galaxy to each of these points. And this is done by what is known as this radio galaxy fraction. What people actually observed is radio galaxies and people observe mass of the halos. And they have made some plot of radio galaxy mass versus halos. So that gives a radio galaxy fraction. Or you can do what I have done before is basically do a full halo occupation distribution. Turns out they don't match completely. They're not very different. They're very close by. Okay. So you take the radio galaxy fraction. You take what is the distribution of these halos. So you know how radio galaxies are distributed in the classical structure. Okay. Once you have that, immediately you can calculate something which is very interesting. You can calculate what is the mean distortion? Absolutely, mean average distortion, the L equal to zero. Mean distortion of the CMB sky due to radio galaxies, non thermal distortion. Okay. So you look at the radio galaxy, look at the volume, look at how much volume radio galaxy sustains approximately in the radian, calculate what is the delta T or for the radio galaxy, average over all the distribution, and then you get by this formula. Okay, so there is this thing which connects the radio galaxy to the halo. Okay, there is something which basically tells you the number densities of halo. This tells you what is the area that one radio galaxy basically substance. So this is the size by the distance. Okay, and then there is the flux, the, the delta T from one. Okay. You do that. And when you do that, this is what you get. So you get a mean distortion that as you come to lower redshift, it adds up because it's more radio galaxies are adding up. And depending on what is your model you choose, you get some mean distortion, okay? So you can choose some model. You can choose whatever was the preferred model for the model data and that will be a mean distortion. This is something that's the first thing people have tried to do with radio galaxies, okay? But this was done very, not correctly, because what they did was they tried to constrain radio galaxy. One paper by Yamada, Sudhiyama, Silk, they tried to constrain radio galaxy model by comparing this mean distortion with the Kobe distortion. Now, Kobe actually gives an upper limit on the mean distortion. It's very powerful. So, it considered all sorts of things we're comparing with Kobe distortion, which is why is okay, 1.5 to the power minus 5 is delta T by T. But that, if you have to correctly compare, you have to actually compare your delta T, not the delta I. Again, you have to do it correctly. If you do not do the delta so G mu correctly, then you are not going to get the correct delta T. So, People had very strong limits. Delta I and delta T are three. No, no, delta I, remember, there's a G, this frequency dependent part. So you have to correctly do the frequency. You cannot take the thermal and do it. Okay. okay. So now, where does we, where does the radio galaxy stand? So this is the interesting figure. Okay. So you're talking about all sorts of, so this figure has every uh, foregrounds that you can think of. Okay. So I'll take like a minute to explain the figure. Okay. Did you put using Yeah, all these models are allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did not put up a limit. Uh, I think it have to go large. So if you take this Q to 10 to 48, then it violates. Yeah. Q times 10 to 47, it violates. Where does it go? So that would be good the factor of 10 improvement over 40, then yeah. you can start seeing. Yes. So this is the one that I want to show you here. This is a plot of the mean distortion due to different components. So these are all your foregrounds. So I see the dust is a foreground, you know, then the CID, the synchrotron, free free, you know, uh, Amy, which is spinning dust. Okay, then we are wide the, from galaxy clusters, which is a foreground for us. What we want to know is how does our mean, mean distortion, how does that look? So this is the intensity delta i, okay, the distortion and versus frequency. This line, which I've actually drawn with hand, I mean, on, on the figure, the line was there, it's not just the thing you've drawn. I'll just use to highlight this. This line is for 
the non thermal distortion by radio galaxies. I put this one because this is something that people have been trying to get for a long time. This is one of the holy grails. This is the mu distortion that Rishi talks about. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, if you are trying to get this distortion, you'll also be getting this distortion. The holy grail for this is going to find this. And these green lines are basically the pixie and super pixie. Uh, um, instrumental noise sensitivities. Okay. So now, if you do for pixie, okay. By the way, this is in temperature. You see that uh, you can with pixie, you can basically detect it depending on how you subtract to this mean uh, to five point four or three sigma approximate detection. So there's a detection of uh, this mean distortion from these radio galaxies. So this is something completely new. So this is uh, very what similarly just like the mean, yeah. This uh, just, yeah. So I'm supposed to observe the sum of Yes. Explain supposed to find the heat. Here in the dust means like you have to do component separation over here. So those numbers were done properly with component separation. That num five sigma was done with proper component. Oh, this is exactly the same uh, technique that Planck uses to separate out. Uh, so as long as you know what is the frequency uh, spectrum of any of so all depends on basically knowing the frequency spectrum of each of them very accurately. So if you know the frequency spectrum very accurately, then you can do and of course, it, it will all depend on which you can say much better than this. Let me say that until now, no one has been able to extract the only signal from So we have plan for small scales, they don't really they, 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 you know, they talk about component separation and how they move for components. They just subject it out. CMB. But actually, you better use the cosmology, precision cosmology, that you don't use all the component separations. They just take a small snack of the sky, give it the score of the below CMP, right. and they're only using yeah. that data to get all your cosmology data. But this can be, I think this is also, if, if they do it for Planck, for small foreground where there's low CM uh, foregrounds. This is this is a smaller scale, so you can definitely get a patch like that. The plant has less than more channels, so okay. people are optimistic that with more channels, you will be able to extract. So Pixie, which yeah. probably will not go on, Pixie has 300 channels. Okay. And these things were done with, I, mean, I didn't do it 300 channels, it was done with smaller number of channels. One final plot, let me show you before I just quickly finish. So this is with the mean. You can also do power spectrum, okay. Just like the first power spectrum that I showed. So let me show you the power spectrum over here quickly. This is a plot of power spectrum. This is the thermal SZ power spectrum galaxy clusters, which people have been detecting regularly these days. And this is sort of the power spectrum that you get for radio galaxies. So at L of 1000 is like 1% of the thermal SZ, and over here is like 10% of the thermal SZ. Okay. Question is given again all the power spectrums, can you detect this? Okay. This is more difficult than the mean, but not impossible. So over here, this is the power spectrum, this red, okay? And just look at the bold lines. That's why I view it in bold. And this bold line is basically the total uh, instrumental noise from pixie-like instruments but not with 300 uh, frequency band, only with 30 frequency bands. And it looks like that we are sort of reaching this with 30 frequency bands. So once you get to more frequency bands, this should definitely be doable. Okay, so I've run out of time. I've done going for a long time. What do you do with this? For, you can, you know, this alpha P you can get, you can get the halo approach and distribution. So basically do cosmology and radio galaxy physics. So I'll come to the last slide. So this is my prophecy. I thought I would give you the prophecy in the last slide. 
You see, the history of SG observation has been for 50 years. 69 proposed from early 70s, 72, I think was the first observation they tried. Okay. And uh, it has been doing for 50 years and uh, things were really bad. I mean, no one was getting anything at the beginning. If you look at the early, and slowly and slowly determination and things have gone down and down and down, better and better and better. In fact, the first attempt of Hubble constant had more than 100 kilometers per megaparsec per second as the error bar. Okay, now it is less than five kilometers. So this is like what you get from other experiments. Okay, you can talk about biases, but also you know the, when they looked at the SZ fluctuations from RMS fluctuation from SZ galaxy clusters, the first SZ RMS cosmology was actually my first paper in uh, in PhD. Over there, you could only basically constraint that your omega matter should not be more than 0.4. That was the only thing that you could do. Now you are basically using it to probe dark energy, doing sigma eight, everything. Okay, that's in 20 years. Okay. Also, when I was doing dark energy clusters, this was 100 clusters, around 150 clusters from all surveys. Planck itself gives thousands. SPT now each survey gives more than thousands of clusters. The future surveys will go to tens of thousands of clusters. So this is how things have gone. So my prophecy is that, you know, over here also, and my prophecy doesn't come, it's interesting. <laughs> okay. You have no prophecy. I have no prophecy, just looks like. So here also in the next 10 years, 15 years, this is where things are going. Now, the first uh, observation of the radio galaxy SD has been made. I think the first, not, I cannot say that rigorous, it can be even more rigorous, but far more rigorous than what was done before. Proper spectral distribution, modeling, everything has gone together to give the theory. And so in the next uh, 10, 15 years, uh, hopefully we will be really doing a new uh, kind of uh, CMB secondary anisotropies. So I started with, uh, oh, there it is. It is there, okay. Oh. So I started with this. This was the zoo. All of them are different. This is kinetic SZ, this is thermal SZ. Okay, this is kinetic SZ. And now there's a completely new boy, which is non-thermal SZ. Remember, th kinetic SZ, kinetic SZ, very difficult to separate. Thermal SZ, thermal SZ, very difficult to separate. Non-thermal SZ, completely different. Okay. So we have a new secondary semen as well. So this is where I'm going to stop and thanks. And if you have questions. Now. What? Mic? Which mic? How do I know? Oh, you turned off something. No, I don't think I'm getting one next question. Say, I have more details on this thing, but then you can come back, come to your office, and I can sort of give you. Yeah. Did you do any prediction for flux of the intermediate condition? Was it? There is some observation time. Huh. Okay. I, I would say, okay, I, I didn't do the observation time, but I don't think it's going to be a, I mean, this uh, observations of the Manu okay. things were very fast. It's not, it's not days, not like, it's not like uh, when the SK or what, not SK, the H1 people say that we're going to observe one. Uh, it's difficult time when typical time uh, allocated to yeah, yeah, to watch it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I cannot give anything. Just like that, but I don't think it's a large time. It's, it's which not telescope different. did they use? Which one? ATCA. ATCA. This is one time observation. It's not like you want no, it's one time observation. Time. This is a radio telescope they must have used for I don't know how long. This is not RMS, so it's not very uh, long. RMS observation needs much longer because I'm going to go. Yeah. So, like, just a few hours of the sounds observation can be principal. As I said, I don't know exactly the. But some kind, yeah. Kind of, not some really. No, not, not, I don't think not. I don't think it's a ridiculous. Observation can constrain, can give proper. Yeah. 
number of these. Yeah, but the question is whether they are going to observe all the frequencies at the time. I think they observe at different frequencies. So at the end of it, the frequencies are also on, on cycles. So the SP, CMP S4, they are going to observe at two uh, frequencies at the same time. They have 11 frequencies, but they will observe two frequencies at the same time. But right. uh, yeah. so one such observation is done. What would be the largest source of error to induce the distance? So the largest source of error is in getting their delta t out of the total delta t. Okay. Right. So what they're going to observe, or delta, I shouldn't even talk about delta, delta is a bad thing to say. Getting they have the total decrement, the flux, right? So your delta i, what you are getting. Or I knew actually, not even delta. I knew you get it. How you associate that to these sources versus what you associate to the noise and the and the foreground. Right. So separation of the components, which they're going to do, is the main thing. But we cannot simply subtract the let's say the radio galaxy signal from yeah. the neighbor to yes, so that. You can subtract, but still, the radio is over there. Mm -hmm. Everything so foregrounds are called foregrounds for a reason. Ah, no, I'm saying foregrounds are there in both the cases. No, it's okay. I'm saying ah, you're saying, saying that nearby line of sight here is a foreground. Yeah. That is done. It's not that that is not done, but I mean. Oh, but it's still there is an there. Also, there. remember, there's a, these things can be really done if you have a beam which is very, very uh, small. That you know you are you can reasonably say that this is this and this is radio observations with interferometers typically have very high resolution, so you can look at fluxes from radio sources within a galaxy, do rings around it, and do fluxes of radio sources on the rings, and say if I say that this on the rings are basically the average, then subtract that out from the center. And okay, and that one can be. So this is something that we have done ourselves, but not in this way. But over here to do that, you need really have so micro arc arc second resolutions. This, this radio galaxy arc second resolution. This will never have arc second resolution. So, so the first interesting thing would be to look at the targeted ones and the mean. You know, the mean y is very interesting. I mean, so my thing is that. So, primordial mu, there's so much of physics in it, right? The world's going for it. So, if you're going for it, you're going to go for this also. It's not that this is very different. Our spectrum also feels like the of one minute. Not outside, one minute, yeah. So, it uh, peaks a little more. Uh, this, is, this is around 2000, 2000. This is like, yeah, five, six thousand. Arcmate with many frequencies. Yeah. That's why I, I told Sandeep to send these papers to S4. So he is like, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just send. No, I don't know Sandeep is for the uh, Yeah, I can do that. I wanted something because he gets chance. I said, send this thing and tell that I want to be a part of S4. No, Sandeep is to Lionel. So this is completely something which is yeah anyway. So, so when you are taking the mean time, how are you subtracting the like the foreground? No. So you have to create the estimate No, no. Mean value is not for mean value is for that only. Mean value is to subtract the foreground. No, mean value is for the mean distortion by all the sources that you can think. Ah, then how would we filter these are the, all the foregrounds? See, these are all the foregrounds. So this is the mean distortion due to synchrotron, due to dust. So these are, then you have to subtract all of these. That's why you said it needs digging. Yes, so that's why it needs digging. Yeah. You subtract all of these to, even this straight line. See, this straight line is very interesting. This is from the CMB temperature observation itself. Remember, the CMB temperature has an error bond. Which is 10 to the minus 3 or so. So that itself gives a delta t shift because you don't know the exact temperature. So, from the mean value, how do you 
how can we construct this and reach the yeah so that i said that can be done if you know what is the frequency dependence so this block this was done because we knew what is the frequency. otherwise i don't know how to draw this line right right so each of them i know what is the frequency dependence so for thermal sg the first thermal sg g that's the frequency dependence of thermal so that's a spectral dependence is known for point source for synchrotron i know spectral dependence for free free i know spectral dependence for spinning dust i know for each of them not special dependence, that's different. Spectral dependence, I know. Okay. Special dependence is more difficult. I mean, you don't know exactly how, whether it's the same as over here. Spectral dependence, slightly more theoretical. And then. Once we know they come to that level of accuracy, then this can be really yeah. yeah. Then you basically do a component separation, you do all sorts of filtering is done. Yeah. Over here, of course, the filtering that we did was very simple. And more and more, I mean, better. So when I said these numbers, this was done with crude filtering in a sense. Okay. You can do all, all the last figure that I showed over here. You can do uh, more intelligent uh, separation. And that means there are also other interesting ideas that uh, that uh, is there. So one of the biggest thing is this. Oh. So okay, this is this is the biggest thing. This is the thermal SZ. You know exactly frequency dependence, but still it's very high amplitude. Right? And this is a, a big coordinate. But the thermal SZ, you know, if I identify sources, so this is from all sources, but there are sources with a large insect. So you are actually observing. You know that these are large clusters, so few times of five. You cut them out, basically, literally cut them holes in the sky, and then do the thermal SZ. Then this thing becomes like this. Okay. okay. Then there are regions where this difference is not that much. No, but the energy of the initial thing that has energy distribution, right? The thermal has a different energy distribution, they're not having a different energy distribution. The amount of energy a photon will gain depends on the energy of the photon. You have to control with the energy of the of the things, electrons that are scattered. So if a thermal distribution, the energy of the electron has a spectrum, but non-thermal is a different spectrum. Also, thermal do not go to very high energies. Spectrum of CMB will depend on the spectrum of electron. This is not scattering and not your system. This is not scattering. But I'm scattering. That is because electrons have more energy. Okay, okay. It can be opposite also. It can be non okay. <laughs> different energy. But over okay. here, it's three Kelvin photon type. Right. And these are very easy to be yeah. In fact, these are even energetic the million degree gases. These are non thermal, very high energy gas uh, plus power. It is straight from the black hole. Really high. You can write down a temperature. Temperature is not the right thing to do. You can have an equivalent temperature. And those are you know, tens of millions of degrees. Yeah. Anything else? Come to my office and I can give you more details. Okay. Thank you.